Hello, and welcome to the Atheist Experience. Today Hi. is Sunday, April 15th, 2018. I'm your host, Tracy Harris, and with me today is co-host Eric Murphy. Hello, hello. <laughs> surprise, everyone. Yeah. Surprise, it's Tracy, and surprise, it's Eric. <laughs> uh, I bet everyone is very surprised. We're surprised. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Today, the Atheist Experience is a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, a Texas nonprofit educational organization dedicated to promoting separation of church and state and positive atheist culture. Uh, before we get rolling today, I do have a special announcement. The uh, Atheist Experience YouTube channel did roll over 200,000 subscribers. 200,000? So, yeah. yeah! That's a milestone for us. And the, here's the, the even also important part <laughs> is that we're going to be partying here at the Free Thought Library afterwards. So do not go looking for us at Star of India restaurant this evening. So we will <laughs> not be at the regular dinner at Star of India. We will be here at the Free Thought Library at 1507 West Koenig Lane. So just make a big note. I will try to remember to announce that again later in the show just to make sure that we keep reminding people because I don't want people to show up at Star of India and be disappointed. So feel free to come out to the Free Thought Library, join us and help us celebrate 200,000 subscribers. That is amazing. Yeah, very, wow, very wild. <laughs> well, I mean, especially because um, it wasn't that long ago that we got the silver play button. Yeah. So, I mean, the AXP has been just, well, it's already been big, but just shooting up, you know, it's, it's really fun to see. Yeah, and so just to sort of let people know, uh, you know, Matt obviously is in Canada, so he was unable to host today, so I'm on, you get me instead. And uh, Don was also unable to make it today, so Eric was good enough to stand in for us from Taki then. <laughs> Yeah. So he happened to be here since uh, he helps <laughs> rile up the crowd beforehand and also does the show right for this one. Mm -hmm. So very convenient. Yeah. Do you have anything to talk about? Um, a couple things. Okay. Uh, so first, yeah, um, you you guys popped over 200,000. We, we popped over 15,000. It's cool. not, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a thing for us. Um, also, uh, I actually... Uh, became the social media coordinator for the ACA. Congratulations! This last week. So you get a lot of work. <laughs> I, I do, I do, but it's but I'm really, really excited, and specifically to all of you. Um, if you are a member, you should be starting to see things. And if you are not a yet a member, take a look. Go on the website and uh, see what it takes to become a member. Um, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be really exciting this year, and I can't wait to get started. Cool. So. Big job. Yeah. Good. I'm ready for it. Good. All right. Is there anything else? Um, I don't think so. All right. Well, then let's hit calls. All right. All right. So we are starting tonight with Andrew in Twinsburg, Ohio. You are on with Tracy and Eric. Hey. How are you doing, Tracy? How are you doing, Eric? Hey. Good. hey. Thank you. Hope you're well as well. I'm doing all right. I wanted to talk about some scientific uh, statements I found in the Bible. Okay. Hmm. It says in uh, Job uh, thirty-eight thirty-one, can you bind the clusters of Pleiades or loose, loosen the belt of Orion? I find this interesting because the telescope was invented in 1608, but this book, how did this book know that Pleiades are bound together by gravity, but the uh, stars in Pleiades... Wait, the stars in Pleiades are bound together by gravity. Where does it say gravity? It doesn't, but oh, it, okay. it binds the cluster. I was just making... Like bind the cluster, like they're bound together by gravity. Mm, well, uh, it doesn't Pleiades. say gravity though, right? Correct. All right. I mean, I could observe... But we the... didn't discover that. Right. Till hundreds of Which is probably why it doesn't say that. I mean... But it you're... says loosen the belt of Orion. You, yeah, because Orion has a bell. I mean, this is you realize Job is like a a a poet, like a poem, right? It's a it's a yeah. poetic fiction story. It's written in in poetry, and yeah. and there's like an added section at the end where they revamp the ending a little bit to to make it more in line with, hey, I I'm the you know the mighty God, don't question me. Because originally it was written to show how bad things can happen to good people, and then it changed into a story about how even if horrible things happen to good people, it's God, so don't ask questions. That's why it ends so weirdly, right? As opposed to the rest of the story. Yeah. 
Um, but I think you're basically taking poetic language and translated poetic language, you know, at that, um, well, and, and, and then applying modern thought to it. And also, I mean, you're you're taking something and trying to interpret it into something that you know is scientific. I, I, I just find that dishonest. I mean, if your God wanted to talk about gravity, it would say, "Gravity is this," right? I mean, if 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 your God wanted to talk about the way that the universe works, it would be clear. It wouldn't be hidden away in in home. Yeah. Well, I just think it's uh, astonishing. Just There's other things in this book, too, Job. Behold, even the moon has no brightness, and the stars are not pure in, its, in his sight. Andrew, didn't, so I the moon itself didn't we just uh, talk about that? Like, I just addressed, right, trying to find something in it, trying to find something in your Bible and, and, and interpret it in such a way. Like, give us some, give us something hard. Give us your best, not just... Oh, yay, poetry. All right, we can talk about something in Psalms. As Hi. far east as from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This ver that verse only works if the earth is round. Moving from east to west only works if the, if the earth is round. As far as the, earth, as far as the east is from the west, so has... God removed our transgressions from us. How does that require roundness? I could have like my arms out and say, as far as you know, the, my arm on the left and my arm on the right, that's how far you know God has removed our transgressions from us. How does that? They don't need to meet. Yeah. They can just be things that are considered far apart. Correct. I mean, you're you're reading poems. I'm I, I'm kind of stunned because e now Psalms. That's not even. Uh, so there are some people who may not understand that Job was originally written as poetry, but some, but everybody knows the Psalms are poems, and that's what the Psalms are, right? So this is poetry. This is not a science book you're reading. This is someone writing flowery language, very very taking a lot of liberties with the language to make poems and songs. We can go to Corinthians eh, if you want to. I mean, we could do this all day, I guess, but I don't understand. I, I guess, you know, we could do this with the Quran as well. And in fact, people who believe in the Quran will do this to, uh, all day long to the wall. And I think but, people that believe in the, the prophecies of Nostradamus will take those and talk about all day long how those apply to, you know, modern situations or, you know, close to modern situations. And you can reinterpret things all day. If something's observable though, like if I see stars near each other, it would be like somebody saying what binds us to the globe, you know, or the, the, the God who has bound us to the planet. And I mean, you can see that we stick to the planet, that we don't go flying off into the sky. So observing that doesn't really explain scientifically how it occurs, it's just a recognition that it does. N not only that, but, but if, even if yeah. you talk about one scientific Well, it's, thing. it's an observable reality. I, I don't know. I mean, you, calling it scientifically accurate is a little weird because there's no real science behind it. It's just an observation. I'm not making a scientific claim when I say people don't go flying off into the sky. What sticks us to the ground? It's it, it just acknowledging that we do stay on the ground and you try to jump up and you fall back down to the ground. Something pulls things. If you fall off a cliff, you hit the ground. Something clearly is, is pulling you toward the ground, but just observing that is not a, I mean, science may have thoughts about that or explanations for it or theories for it, but me observing it, it's just an observation. But it's a correct observation. <laughs> right, but it's observation as well. Who wouldn't be able to recognize it? Well, they're talking about stars, uh, yeah, stars light years away. Yes, but I can see stars light years away with my naked eye. I can see constellations light years away. I see Orion every time I go out for a neighborhood walk. And I see Orion's belt. And you know what? I've never seen it loosened. He's always got it on. <laughs> totally same, same belt loop every time. All right, I'll give my best evidence for God then. <laughs> okay. I don't want to work in... Uh, ambergris. It's uh, when Jonah was, uh, I don't know how to say it, thrown up by the whale. 
when we look at ambergris, people spend thousands and thousands of dollars on whale vomit. Yeah. What's amazing about what's amazing about this is that one of the wor- God can make one of the worst smells in the world and turn it into a fantastic fragrance. So God can make a sinner like All Jonah. Right. I think we're being trolled now. I, I'm oh, starting yeah. to think we're being trolled because, I mean, if you're talking about scientific proofs and then you raise Jonah, I have to think you're pulling our leg because obviously it's not a science. When you talk about observable fact, it's an observable fact that people don't get swallowed by a giant fish and survive three days in their stomach and then get vomited on a shore. So this is in complete conflict with everything we know about things eating other things and what happens once you are eaten. And the idea of something is big enough to swallow whole of a human being. Uh, even if there were such a thing, it would digest you. But when we find whales that are dead on the shore... It's not a whale. It was a great fish. Well, it, there's... there's because and if you have ever seen a killer fish. whale eat something, it's not swallowing it whole. It's pretty <laughs> gruesome. Well, actually, when we find whales on the beach, when they're dead, we find sweatpants, we find plastic bags, golf balls, towels, gloves. I'm not saying they can't eat things. I'm saying there's a reason they have they teeth. They swallow their, I, think, I forget which whale swallows. Have you them. seen? One of them swallows completely. Uh, most whales have a baleen and those that don't have teeth and there's a reason for that and they may be able to swallow some things but saying that they swallow a human being and then three days later that human being is still alive and you're claiming that this book is scientifically sound I think you're pulling our leg Uh, so it's scientifically sound except for when it's not I mean that's what you're basically saying I'm not saying that this is a miracle in the Bible. Right. You're, the you're saying it's it's scientifically sound to, except yeah. for when it's not. How is that even helpful? I can write a book that's scientifically sound except for when it's not. Yeah. And then when you say that's not possible according to science, I can say, yeah, let's just call those miracles, those things that don't really, you know, tie themselves to observable reality. Or metaphor. Uh, oh, all right. Thanks for taking my call. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great one. All right. Okay. So Andrew's <laughs> logging off. All right. Any thoughts? Or I think we covered it. Yeah. I, I, everything that I wanted to say, you just said. So All right. we're solid. Well, now we're going to let you say some <laughs> things. Um, so we've got... No. Uh-oh. That's okay. No, this is cool. I don't want to. Okay, we have Jimmy T. from San Antonio on the line. Hi, Jimmy. You're on with Tracy and Eric. Jimmy. Okay, it's okay. So we meet again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, our call dropped. I don't know if we call. <clears throat> Jimmy called in earlier today to talk to you. Though. Okay, so that's great. You get to talk to Eric some more. Mm, okay. <laughs> well, no, no, really. I wanted. I really wanted to talk to you, uh, Jason. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, I've called uh, the show before, and I got to talk to you for a little bit, but um, Matt ended up hanging up on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't. I don't know if you recall. We we discussed. Um, the study is uh, being done at Johns Hopkins so with the acetatibin, the mystical experience. Okay. I don't know if you ever looked, followed up on it or looked up on it, but um, uh, basically what they're saying is their findings are in accordance to a, a view uh, known by truly gifted mystic philosophers, physicists, uh, as the perennial philosophy. And I mentioned it last time to you, Tracy, but I don't know if you okay. ever looked into it. Well, let's check it out right now. <laughs> Yeah. In the meantime, though... Yeah, keep talking. Yeah. Um, is this what you call... Uh, is this the same thing you called about uh, to talk heathen on? That yeah, uh, and, people and who are dosed with I, I, psilocybin uh, yes. had uh, mystical and I heard your criticism last time, man, and I wanted to make a comment, but I don't, something happened on the call. I don't know how it dropped, man. I, but, uh, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I, 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 you never answered what um, mysticism is. Or what a mystical experience is. You say that all of these people okay. experience mystical experience, and then you say, sure, "Oh well, sure. I know the definition." Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Don't. Wait, I, okay. So I, I did take a quick look at this page, right, on perin- perennial philosophy, and what it says here is that it's a perspective within the philosophy of religion which views each of the world's religions and spiritual traditions as sharing a single, universal truth and a single divine foundation of knowledge. Is that your understanding? 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, so and, this uh, really doesn't matter uh, if a person has a mystical experience or not, because that would be irrelevant. Some religions don't have mystical experiences, and yet they would be part of this tradition as well, correct? No, I, I think what they're no? sorry, the scientists are trying to say is, is yeah, is, is that the authentic religion resides in individuals Ooh. engaging this, what they're mm, calling... Yeah, no, I don't think that, that science tells us what is authentic religion. <laughs> Well, no, well, I, I mean, the, that's the implication mm. out of what, what they're finding. Like, in other words, like, um, I, I realize that science doesn't go out. Uh, it, it's not in the purview to try to discover God. It doesn't go out and say, okay, we're, we're out to uh, prove or disprove God. Each it of the world's say, religions you know? and spiritual traditions share a single universal truth and single divine foundation of knowledge. Is that your understanding of perennial philosophy? Well, it's, um, perennial philosophy has shifted uh, in, be, due to this research. In other words, um, the view ha has shifted to uh, towards emphasis on these type of experiences. That why? When there, are, when there are religions that are recognized that don't have these experiences, why would it shift toward that instead of towards um, something well, like, more universal? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean, which um, religion? Well, it, uh, remember, it, it refers to the major religion. So if you're referring okay. to something outside of that, then... Um, because uh, perennial philosophy is speaking on the, the origin of the major religions. Right, and I was raised Christian, and we did not believe in mystical experiences. So I'm saying we I, would okay. we would I, be I, a religion I, as well. Uh, um, you may not, uh, I don't know if you study comparative religion, but if you go back to the schism <laughs> of 1054, um, there was a, the, the original Roman Catholic, Catholic Church was separated. Uh, the original Eastern Orthodox tradition always practiced mysticism. There was Christian Okay, monks. let me, let me try Gloria. to just make this simple. There are loads of religions okay. who do not have mystical experiences, and those are legitimate religions. If the idea is to oh. find the universal reality behind all the religions, I would think no. you would want to find the universal I, experience yes. instead of what, something that happens to some and not others. You're postulating that. You're postulating that. I don't think that's true. No, it, I'm it, reading it here it. at the definition of perennial philosophy. I can try to find another yeah, definition. No, no, but... no. I understand you're re you're reading that, but I'm saying that your assumption that the Christianity is not about mystical experiences is not true because if you actually go into the origins of the religion, that's what you find. You right, find but I'm talking like about religions, all religions, right? And so there are sects of Christianity yeah. who do not have well, this experience. So mm -hmm. we would want to, I would think, look at the universal Yes. experience that would no, be... No, I, I agree, but scholars have recognized this and they, they, they have found the point where it broke off. Okay, they, well, where, our, wherever our, it our broke religion. off, it broke off because some people didn't have this experience that you're saying is universal in exactly. religion. But, and so there are some people who don't, don't have this universal experience, which means that it is not a universal experience. Well, you see, it broke off in such a way where the religions that didn't emphasize this, they, they took a, uh, if you look into the schism of 1054, uh, religion... Uh, what difference uh, does uh, it make? Are we saying that these religions have a universal foundation or that they don't? Yes. yes okay, they exactly. do. Then the they ones that don't have mysticism foundation. should be included in that and we should look for what is universal because... No, I'm saying they... <laughs> I'm saying those religions broke off from their original foundation. Because they weren't having the same ideas, thoughts, and experiences. No, no, not because of that, because they misinterpreted their original text. If you look into oh, the schism on. of 24... No, I'm serious. No. I, wait a minute, I'm serious. <laughs> These are religions that exist today who do not have yeah. this experience. Therefore, it is not a universal. I, I, I understand that, right. but it's because for thousands of years they have... I don't touch. care why yeah. they're not having the experience. <laughs> they're not, which means it's not a universal. And honestly, um, is, well, so, so if I it doesn't fall I into your spectrum, here. right, if it doesn't fall into the exact thing that you're trying to say, then, oh, they just deviated no. from it? What about I, I, I don't I'm, know? I'm not, is there any room in there for, for I don't know? I, I'm, I'm, this is not my view. I'm trying to reiter reiterate what has been demonstrated by science. Why would I want um, to talk to you about someone else's view? Yeah. I thought this show was to talk to um, callers about what they believe and why. Sure, uh, but I'm, I'm yeah. adhering to the science. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know what I mean? I, I don't, I follow evidence as Jimmy. well, and I follow these things Science as well. doesn't tell <laughs> us about true religion. Yeah, that, that word, I, I don't think it means what you think it means. 
I know. I, I I would say that it, that's your biased perspective. If you actually, if you refer to what I'm referring to, the schism of 1054, you will see. I don't care what happened that, in 1054. That, we have examples of religions today who do not have yes, this experience. But, but, I don't care see, why they don't what have I, it. What I'm trying it's to tell you, it's been centuries. Today's today's conception is a contortion of what it originally meant. It, it's a I don't care. It's, it's a religion. It's still a religion. These are still religions. <laughs> and where are you getting yeah, that it's from? It's a remnant of... of what, what Christianity it, is a break off from what Judaism, but I don't care. It's still, it's a, you know, it's still a religion. I don't care what it came from. Sure, but I, I would argue that it's a pale reflection of what it originally meant. How would you know? Those reasons. Right, but maybe maybe they found a, how do you know they didn't have a better path and that's why they broke off? That they didn't find a more well, real you, path. I can give you another example. Um, are you familiar with, okay, you're familiar with Greek religion, uh, Zeus and his offspring and so forth. Yeah, right? and Roman mythology which follows very okay. closely. Well, did you know that the major philosophers like uh, Plotinus, uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, they criticized the mainstream religion as being something born out of the of human imagination, Zeus and all his offspring. And for them, the true religion was through hygnosis. It was with new. Uh, it was what Plotinus would eventually call the one. I don't. What was, I'm saying is, was, people can argue all day about which religions are the true religions because everybody's pointing at each other, yeah. saying, "I am," and "You are," and "They are," and half of them are sure. saying, "We're the only true religion," and nobody else that tells you anything religious is telling the truth. But my point is, mm. there are loads and loads of religious people who consider themselves to be part of a true religion who do not have a mystical experience. And you explaining why doesn't change the fact that it's a fact. Um, I, well, again, I disagree. I mean, like... You uh, can't uh, disagree. It's like a said, fact. Some it, it, people who are no, religious no, no. don't uh, have mystical experiences. And you have no more right to no, say that I, their religion I, is false I, than I they have to say I yours is. I agree that these modern sects don't emphasize mystical experience. If you even try to mention modern. it, you'll probably... Yeah, think I don't know that every sect historically devil. ever had this mystical experience. I know that there are some that I, did. Well, I would disagree with that. You I would couldn't you possibly see, know if that were true or <laughs> not. History. You could that not... Shows, po his, not all religions have been historically recorded. There is no way to know that well, every religion in history up until 1054 had mystical experiences. Right. Do you understand the implications of trying to make that claim? It's an impossible claim to make. I, I, I think it, people are making it today. I mean, there's no, it's yeah, an impossible <laughs> claim <laughs> to make. If somebody claims that they know that, they are wrong. I, I well, I, I disagree again. Like, I, yeah. I, I think the, you can see the part these misses. Okay, so he disagrees. I don't yeah. know what to say. We don't have a written history for every culture. I, going back, for, we don't have written histories for many cultures that exist today. So I don't see how anybody could make these claims about every religion that ever existed everywhere on the planet for all time, up until 1054, when suddenly there was this breakout of people who didn't have mystical experiences, which would show that it's not a universal. And it hasn't been for centuries. So if you're looking for a universal, that's not it. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, his, his evidence uh, earlier today was uh, people who take magic mushrooms uh, get high. Yeah. And uh, there. Okay. So. All right. So that uh, is that. So now I, I'm laying all my hopes on Benjamin and Elijah. And you're talking to Tracy and Eric and Please, please give us something worth talking about. A nice biblical name. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys. Hello. Um, we just we just want to ask some questions just because we're not really familiar with atheism. That's the best um, time to are, ask questions when you have when you want to know more. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, that's yeah. what we want to call in for. <laughs> yeah, because we, we are theists, yes, but we just don't know much about atheism. Thank you for just, calling, and we yeah. we're happy to answer. So kind of what are like the basic foundations of atheism? <laughs> um, oh, that's a, yeah. You, may I? Okay, yeah, go for it. Sure. So uh, let's start by the word atheism, right? A is the rejection of theism. It's the negation of the statement that uh, a God exists or a personal God exists. So yeah. it's only right. the answer to the single question, does a God exist? Everything else, you gotta look elsewhere. I mean, we're skeptics, we're secular humanists, 
and those things help involve, uh, inform our morality and the yeah. way that we look at the world. So the reality is, beyond not believing in a God, you you have to ask each, and it sounds really weird, but you're going to have to ask each atheist what they believe or don't believe about any particular topic because there's no creed. And there are some atheists that believe some weird stuff. There are. <laughs> yeah, I, we have a problem with that because, yes, we do believe in asking questions and mm -hmm. learning more. I mean, that's what we're all about. So, What are your, just your two viewpoints and things you disagree with? About what topics? It's a, it's a big world. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, surprise me, any topic. I like purple. Okay, he likes purple. <laughs> Um, and I have no favorite color, so uh, see, there's a disagreement right there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's not. Okay. He can like purple, and, and me not having a favorite color doesn't really impact that he likes purple, so I guess You're not, not helping a disagreement, the atheist case here. I'm just okay. saying, we have different opinions on colors. Right, doesn't make either one of you right or wrong. Sometimes, oh, though, okay. atheists could be wrong about a thing, and somebody else could be I mean, I've been corrected uh, on certain things that I've thought were correct and somebody will point out, oh, that's wrong. I remember, uh, I'm so, it's embarrassing, but it's like I remember posting something about how there, you know, science can't explain how bees can fly. <laughs> okay, I fell for it. And then somebody was like, um, yeah, that's kind of an old wives' tale. It's not really true. And, you know, then so I looked into it and I was like, oh, okay, so yeah, there's an explanation for how bees can fly. So sometimes okay, so I can be wrong about things. <laughs> yeah. Right. We, we all get wrong at things at times. Um, so why don't you believe in God? Okay, so let's, again, remember the part where I said it's the negation of the statement? Yes, I okay. remember that. Okay, so let's, let's be clear about this, right? Um, am I speaking to Ben or Elijah? I think you're this talking to ben. both of them, right? Ben, okay. Tracy has a jar okay. of gumballs, okay? You okay. and I both walk in. We've never seen the jar. Tracy's got the jar. She says... Uh, you need to guess whether it is there's an even amount of gumballs or an odd amount of gumballs in the jar. And I say, Tracy, I know for a fact that there's an even an amount of gumballs in that jar. Ben, do you believe me? Yeah. I know for a fact it's mm -hmm. an even number of gumballs in that jar. Even though he's never seen the jar yeah. until the same time you did. Well, you could be wrong. It could be an odd amount of gumballs. Well, hold on, hold on. Ben, are you saying... Are you saying that you know for a fact there's an odd number of gumballs in that jar? No. I don't know for a fact. I'm just I'm just guessing because maybe there is maybe there oh. is even not. maybe there is an odd. Yeah, maybe, but it, we should probably wait until we count the gumballs, right? Yeah, right. That's the intellectually honest thing to do, right? Yeah, that would be. Yeah, that's where we are with atheism. So just, yeah, just to kind of help put that in perspective, what he's trying to illustrate is the idea that first and foremost, atheism would be the, the idea that there, there's something called agnostic atheism, which I think most atheists identify with, which is the idea that I don't know how many gumballs are in the jar, right? I don't know if there's a God or not, so I'm not... I'm not pinning it on. I'm not pinning anything down on this yet. So let me just wait until there's better information. Because right now there's not enough information for me to make that decision. People are making a lot of claims, and I'm not buying any of it until I have better information. So that's the position of a lot of atheists. Some atheists go a little further, and they're just like, I think it's bunk, and that's like a, another attitude where they the the thing they have in common though is that they don't believe. But your follow-up question was, you know, well, why don't you believe? And that's gonna vary a little bit, but most often you're gonna get one of two answers. You're gonna get somebody who's going to say that they actually um, feel that they, that they can solidly say that they don't think that there could be a God that exists, and then you're gonna have a, a larger batch probably that's going to say, because I'm not convinced, I don't think that there's sufficient evidence for me to, you know, hang my hat on at this point. Does that help you understand where they're coming from or where we're coming from? Yeah, that helps us understand different point of views about it. Okay. I like okay. the fact well, that you differentiated, you know, that belief from from the reasoning because that really is an important thing to to keep separate. You know, to say that it's the common ground is is a, is not believing, but there are different reasons and different perspectives that people can come from to get to that decision. 
Yeah, it's the same with religion too. Other people right. have different ideas. <laughs> I've met a couple of Christians that believe in evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, they're neither right nor wrong, really. We can't really prove it either way, but yeah. there's always different viewpoints for a topic. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that's so uncomfortable. Eric yeah. is the yeah. I think, you're the host. I, yeah. Oh, I would just. Say, I mean, like, um, what aspect of evolution do you think? They, well, so, for example, let's say that I wanted to breed a new breed of dog. I'm a dog breeder, and I have this idea for a new breed, and I start breeding, and I like what I'm finding, and so I keep on breeding until I get this look that I want. Right? The this breed that I would like to apply to the whoever the group is that makes the dog breeds, right? The American Breeders Association or something. And I want to get my new breed approved. So if we say evolution doesn't happen and that we can't tell if it's right or wrong, do you have any kind of explanation as to how I produced that particular dog breed if we don't use evolution as our as our model? Oh, I'm not sure about any of that because I'm not... In- I'm totally not an expert, but we were just wondering, like, if, because a lot of evolutionists um, argue that, or say, I should say, that species, for example, A, or like a dinosaur can evolve into like a bird, or a bird can be um, yeah. from dinosaurs. But, well, there's like, a, okay, you know, so like, there's this breakdown. Let's just go through this in little steps. Let's take little chunks and okay. just, we'll see where we start to disagree. So, we do agree, let's say that, I'm going to say we agree, and then you tell me if I'm wrong. So I would say that we do agree that people or a species, a species, a population that can breed sexually, will pass on genes to a future generation. Do we agree with that? We agree, yes. Okay. And we also agree, and again, I'm not, I'm not assuming it, I'm just saying it, and you tell me if I'm where I go wrong. Um, we also agree right. yeah. that by... Breeding for particular traits, like if I like a particular color of hair or color of fur or pattern, um, I should be able to selectively choose animals to breed them so that future generations then will express that trait more and more and express the traits I don't want less and less by, by selectively breeding. Do we agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. It's like it's like breeding plants to get a certain flower. Yeah, and I mean now some things are asexual and they produce clones, right? And it's the same plant over and over. But when you have sexual breeding where genes are coming from a parent population, then you have variation, and you can control for that by selecting. Well, plants can technically be sexual too through. Pollen. They can. Oh yeah, they can. No, I'm not saying that they can't, but I'm saying that there are some that are some things clone, and those would be sort of different than what we're talking about here. But yes, plants yes. can be bred uh, sexually as well. They actually they have very prominent sex organs in fact. So when you so what the base what the basic fundamental like let's just say this is the the baseline evolution concept is is that when I have a population that can breed right within it that population cuz not not all species can breed with each other so when you have a breeding population you can if pressure is exerted that makes certain traits selected for right then yeah the future generations will express that more and express less the traits that we genetically choose against and yeah. by doing no, that we can change what's called so a g there's a little saying when i was in school they taught it and it was the phenotype follows the genotype and all that a phenotype is just think of it in terms of traits traits that an individual can have right so i have brown hair right we know about genotypes. okay great genotypes. great so the phenotypes can be altered in in subsequent generations by That's it. So, by selecting for or against certain traits now, if we do this as the dog breeder, we're artificially selecting, right? So I'm using artificial selection. I've basically, I'm controlling it, and I am producing a specific look in the next generations, trying and trying and, you know, to, to get this look and, and selecting for some traits against others. And then I'm changing the phenotypic traits of the species. I'm changing the hair color, whether or not they even have hair, right? You see the hairless cats and, 
you know, so you can, let's try, let's weed out hair entirely or fur entirely. Let's make the ears folded. Let's make the, the legs shorter. Let's, and you can change this. And then you, then you can create a breeding population that actually has these traits that they start breeding and they're their own population at, at that point. They can probably still interbreed with the parents, um, parent populations, because those are very close in time, right? So from a very basic standpoint, the, the idea of evolution is just that. So you have this idea that species can change over time based on traits being selected for or against. What Darwin added to this was to say that he felt like selection can happen through natural causes, okay, so that you don't have to have a dog breeder choosing the dogs, that something could happen to separate these populations and then one of them has you know, particular survival pressures put on them that are different than where this other part of the population went. And they have different survival um, pressures put on them and both of them in nature because of those pressures are going to have traits selected for or against, like whether or not you have a fur pattern that is good at camouflage in the trees, whereas the other population goes off into the plains, gets split off into the plains, and they end up having to be stealthy and to be, you know, creep along mm -hmm. a little more quietly, and maybe they they look better if they're just plain old, you know, tan colored or brown colored or something, whereas the other one ends up with stripes. Eventually, well, I, I think I understand what you're saying. You're saying that like depending on the environment depends on how the animal is going to change. Well, that's the idea behind um, natural selection, right? Is that the same pressures that we could put on an animal to breed them very swiftly could be put on an animal it, when an when environment changes, right? You're going to have different things that are useful in a different environment than you had in the prior environment. Does that make sense? That does, but wouldn't that be more adaptation rather than evolution? Well, a new no, because, because it's going to be happening through changes in, in the, the gene frequencies of the population. So it, it, by definition, is evolution. And eventually, if you leave those groups uh, alone long enough, uh, they'll no longer be able to interbreed, and that's when you get speciation, and you get new species that can no longer... Right, but there's a... And just to kind of speak to what Eric's saying, there's this idea, I think, that or misconception I think some people have, that there's these little changes, and then sometimes there's these gargantuan big changes, when really what happens is, you know, a big change is just a lot of little changes over time. It's not that, you know, right. there's like some, it's not like, you know, so when people are like, well, why don't dogs give birth to cats? It's like, well, that's a big caricature of what evolution is yeah. actually saying happens, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. saying that there's this giant shift in the phenotypes in one generation. And it sounds yeah, like you understand that. Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. So, I mean, we, we do agree on a lot here, I think. Yeah. Oh, we really do. We really do. Um, but, like, I still don't quite understand. Is... Okay, let's say we have dog A and dog B. Mm -hmm. well, dog B doesn't exist yet. Okay. It's going to come later through evolution. So at what point, I know you can't really answer this because we haven't really studied enough science about this, but what point will that species A turn into that species B? Because well, that species B yeah. has to have species B parent, and it's mm -hmm. got to make species B yep. offspring. This is called, so how does the A this is called speciation, right? And speciation yes. can occur and, and has occurred. And so I would recommend, if you want examples of speciation, because you're right, it's not like I carry these around in my head, but if you want to see, yeah. if you want to see like a list of, of speciation, um, there's a place called Talk Origins, right? And I will tell you right up front, the, the, the main purpose of the site is to deal with creationist claims, like young earth creationist claims. And so they kind of give the answers when people say like, well, what, you know, it, no, there's no such thing as, you know, no one's ever observed speciation. And they will give the examples of speciation that has been observed. And so when people have questions about um, evolution, Talk Origins is a pretty good site to just, that just kind of says, here's the claims we hear most often and here would be the examples that, um, that would apply to those questions. So I don't carry around the list of speciation you know, events in my head. And I would think that even if you went to Talk Origins and you did look at their list, you would probably want to go do further research on your own. And I certainly wouldn't blame you for that. I would say I encourage it. So I wouldn't just say go to Talk Origins and there's your answer. I would say go to Talk Origins, look up the list of speciation 
right, under speciation, and look at those examples, and then go look at the, them up on your on your own and see if if you think they're valid or if you have problems with them. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Well, I just have one more quick question about like evolution stuff. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay. it's not really evolution, yeah. but it's okay, because I'm not a bi I'm not an evolutionary stuff. biologist, no. so I'm just kind of doing my best here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Well, I mean, I'm kind of confused because we were talking about you know how people want to have a certain like breed or and certain t uh, types of traits, but where do like um mutations fall fall? into this. So yeah, you can have genes can mutate, right? Um, and I think that they probably could kick out some other diversity. I doubt that that commonly speaking, a mutation would result in like a huge population shift. It would take a lot of metrics falling into place together, so you'd have to have uh, a significant enough mutation to have an effect on the animal's survival, and it would have to be beneficial in that environment or pretty quickly in an environment that's changing. Um, so you'd have to yeah. have like a beneficial mutation for it to continue, which isn't impossible, but I think, um, and when I'm thinking in terms of mutations, a lot of times they're gonna be negative things that will not continue or in some instances there are going to be situations where it's kind of benign and it may or may not become uh, good or bad later or exaggerated or somehow feed into the population in other ways. But finding a beneficial one, of course, that you know, I would think that would happen occasionally, but I don't think it's going to be the most common example of how mutations would fit into this. All right, yeah, that helps to kind of, but I have another question also, if you don't mind, but I, would, I mean, as... Atheist, this might sound obvious, but like, can you be good without God or like, and like, where do morals come from? No, we, we're, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're horrible people. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I'll, I'll let Eric go and then if I have anything to add, I'll add it. Um, okay. Sure. So, um, that, I mean, it's a really wonderful place. I, I, I want to commend you as well for being so open and honest and ready to ask questions and, and, and you know, meet us where we're at, just like we're wanting to meet you where we're at. And I, I really do want to just emphasize the importance of us having, being able to have this discussion. So thank you both. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so can you be good without God? Well, yeah, um, because where does God come into it? I mean, is there any part of the Bible that is so pivotal that that we can't address the same things? I mean, as far as we're concerned, you're just the same as us, man. So, like, what about, what, what about the Bible? Um, well, I would just add, if I can, the idea of what you were asking, like, you know, where do I think morality comes from? Right? Like, what, yeah, what is right. it? That's more of a yeah, oh, okay. and so there's... Um, if, what, I, what I find really interesting is studies on other species and what's called uh, moral metrics or moral tendencies. Some people call it proto-morality because they're totally uncomfortable acknowledging that another species could have a moral tendency, but I tend to think that I, I do believe we share some tendencies with some of these other species that I, will, I am comfortable calling moral tendencies. So the question becomes, what are, you, what are you testing for? So if you wanted to know, let's say another species, you're looking at another species, you want to know if that animal is moral, right? Are, okay, I'm, I'm a human being, I feel like I'm moral. I want to know if this dog can be moral, right? Does the dog have any kind of morality to it? What kind of things would you test for, right? So you have to kind of yeah, define yeah. what it is that you're calling morality if you're going to see if the dog can behave morally. How are you going to test it? What are you looking for? And so for me... Yeah, that's I hard to do, though, because um, everyone's point of, of view for, um, what's it called, for morality is different. Everyone could be different. Like, like you said, your favorite color. Um, one of your guys like purple, one of you may like right. pink. But this is, why, this is why it's super useful to read animal studies when they do studies to test animals for moral tendencies because it forces people to identify and define what they consider moral. So there's tests that go on with human beings where people will take, the, you, you I'm sure are familiar with moral dilemmas, right? Because you guys sound like the type that would probably be familiar with them. Like those questions yeah. were, you know, it's like there's no right answer. Every, every answer is horrible. 
basically, which horrible thing would you choose out of these horrible scenarios? And so, <laughs> okay. But the point with those tests is to try to get people to think about their, their morality a little bit, right? Like, why am I choosing this? And what is my thinking on this? And in order to, and this helps us define what we're calling morality in people, which helps us define what we would be looking for in another species. So there are actually are some metrics that are put forward that we say, this is part of what, we, what comes together to form morality. And some of those things would be, um, mainly it's stuff that's going to impact your relationships with others, okay? Others of your own species. So the idea of do you understand or do you want fairness, right? So you, do you have a, com, a comprehension of fairness? Do you have some comprehension of empathy? Do you see this other being? Do I see Eric as being like me? So that if something happens to Eric, I think, oh, if that happened to me, right, that, that his arm gets hurt and I'm thinking, oh, that must hurt because it would hurt if it happened to me. So I mirror myself in Eric because he's a human being and I'm a human being. And so I relate to him on this really unique level. And so, we have empathy for one another and we have a sense of fairness for one another. Now, not all, I'm not saying every individual in the species has it, but the species as a whole has a tendency toward these traits, right? Toward empathy, equity, fairness, yeah, right. obligation, yeah. the tight sense of obligation, right? And, um, and there's also things like guilt and things like shame that we can actually uh, leverage against people, right? We know that human beings are capable of feeling these things. It's, it's all the things that we tend to look at as the as those emotional drives right those instinctual drives that gear toward each other as opposed to just ourselves or just an object things that allow me to know that eric is an agent and eric is not an object and make yeah. me respect him as a human and so the question is you know does a dog have a sense of fairness does a chimpanzee have a sense of fairness does it have a sense of empathy and you can actually test for these things. It's very interesting. And it turns out that dogs do have a sense of fairness and it's different than our sense of fairness, which is more similar to a chimpanzee's sense of fairness, right? So in one study, they had dogs that were doing tricks and they would give them treats. And what they found in the particular study that they worked on was that when you gave the dogs treats, when they saw each other get treats for the tricks, <laughs> they were content and they kept doing trick, tricks to get these treats. And it didn't really matter the grade of the treat. So if you gave one dog what would be considered like a higher grade treat, like real meat as opposed to a kibble, it didn't affect the dog's tendencies to continue cooperating. But when you treat them, um, when you don't give one dog a treat and you give another dog a treat, the dog that's not getting treats will stop cooperating much, much sooner. So he's just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's getting it's, treats, it's right? Funny. Like, I'm not going to keep working. I'm not getting treats. And so when you do the similar <laughs> thing with chim when you do a similar thing with chimpanzees, they actually do like look at the quality of the treat, right? They they will get a little bit. I'm not cooperating anymore because they're getting something way better than me. Yeah. And people are kind of like lean more toward that. We don't just see compensation. We see levels of compensation, right? Um, and so right. there, are, there are different senses of fairness, which is to me a really interesting thing. But what it shows me is that these kinds of metrics can exist in other species, but they might be different than what we understand them to be, but they're still demonstrable. So for me, when I think about morality, I think of all these different, like, like a list of different traits that we would identify as separate things, but they would all come into play in my interactions with another person. Right? Yeah, like we share them. With right. The, yeah. Now, what's also interesting is there's this thing called the silver fox experiment, right? Where they actually took these silver foxes who are mostly rogue animals, right? And even a rogue animal has to socialize sometimes, right? So a rogue animal will go out and it has to socialize when it breeds, right? You have, they have to hook yeah, up and breed. Sounds, sounds they different. will, they will yeah. socialize when they come into conflict with territory. So I come to the edge of my territory and you're there and I don't expect you to be there because this is my territory. And so we'll have an interaction there. So they do still recognize each other as a species. They recognize one another as a fox as opposed to a predator or a prey animal. Um, but at the same time, they are, they are very, very so solitary animals, but they are also highly prized for their fur. Right? So in the fur trade, they have a lot of these animals that they have to deal with. And one problem is they are very ferocious animals. They're very vicious little foxes. So one guy got the idea to make them more passive. 
So he started breeding them for passivity. The, the, the animals that didn't attack the cage every time he walked by, he started trying to breed those to try and create something that was easier to work with. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, eventually, he created something that was almost like a little dog. It didn't even look like the fox anymore. The and coat so was cute. totally different. It had this curly, crazy tail. It barked. The foxes never made noises other than like snarling and growling and assaulting the cage. But these little guys, you know, they were just adorable little fluff balls, right? And he didn't expect to breed something that looked completely different. In fact, that was against, like they wanted to try and breed something with the same fur and they got like all, over, all across the board, different types of fur and cute little things that were barking and social. And so these little guys were more inclined to socialize which is what is required for those moral metrics, right? I mean, I ha what, if I just run around by myself all the time, I don't really need to have a whole lot of, of those metrics. But if, I, if, you've, if you breed you know, my species to the point where we start actually interacting more in a friendly way, that's a demonstration, I would think, of instilling morality, or at least moral tendencies, or to make some people more comfortable, proto-moral tendencies, into this species, which I found really fascinating. That is fascinating. You used an interesting word, though. You used the word metric. Yeah. How do you how do you judge something by its metrics? Like, let's well, use uh, the meter, for example. The what? The meter, like a meter. Oh, a me when I'm talking, I mean, when I'm talking about a metric, right? Fairness is a is a metric. And we would measure it. I know, I know what you meant. Oh, I'm okay. Just, I'm using it in a different form. Oh, okay. I, don't... I, I do I do kind of have a point where I'm going with this. Okay. So play along for a little bit. Sure. So how do you compare, how do you make sure a meter is a meter? Well, you have to have a scale, right? You'd have to develop a scale. And you would have to test that scale, right? So in, in scientific research, for example, what you would do is you would try, you would go ahead and develop that scale and then you would have different people make judgments and then you would compare all those inputs. They would have to do it separately and not in conjunction with one another and you get that back and you'd see if it was just all over the map. So if people were looking at my instructions as far as how those metrics should be measured and what I get back is a whole bunch of different feedback on a similar test, where they're all saying different things about the same set of subjects, then I know that my metric is not well-defined and well-measured, right? But if I get back the feedback and I'm getting really high corresponding results, that's a good sign that, that this metric is, is working. Is that Wouldn't what you're that asking? Wouldn't that be the same for morals too? Well, yeah, because I'm talking Wouldn't about moral metrics, in fact, right? Right, that's that's what I meant by relating this yeah. to it. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. But like, wouldn't we need a single, a singular reference point in order to establish our morals and what it, what we find morally correct? Mm, okay, wait. This is a different thing. So the, now there's this, there's the idea of do you have a sense of fairness, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is a precept argument. It's okay. And then the idea is, different people are going to apply this in situations differently. So you could have, like for example, those moral dilemmas, you could be asking people what they would do and they'll give you different answers and some of them will say, well, I think it would be fair to handle it this way, I think it would be fair to handle it that way. There's been many times when you can look at a situation and say, you know what, I can see both sides of this. I can see why this person feels like they have a, a beef and I can feel like why this person feels like they have a beef and you know, this is not an easy question to answer. You're talking about how the metrics are applied not whether or not there are metrics, right? Yeah. So the, there, are, there is a sense of fairness, but now when a moral philosophy, if you want to develop a moral philosophy from that, if you want to say, like, I'm going to say that the most good for the most people is my moral philosophy, and every time you know, something comes up, my sense of fairness, my sense of all this stuff is going to come into play underneath this moral philosophy that is most good for the most people. I'm not saying that's the way to... that. That's just a moral philosophy somebody might use. But you, every, a lot of people have different moral philosophies or moral codes that they're going to go by about how they apply these things. But the metrics themselves are what is morality. Yeah, okay, I understand. It's like using a foot, like, like using a foot ruler with a meter ruler. 
people are going to be slightly different, but it's basically the same thing. Yeah, and some people are but going they, to have a stronger yeah. sense of empathy. Yeah. Some people are going to have no empathy, and some people are going to have so much empathy that they may have trouble, you know, like uh, using a can of Raid. I mean, it, there's some people that are going to have empathy that just overflows so far it even goes into like other species and things, right? Whereas some people are going to have no empathy even for other human beings. They'll see horrible suffering and be like, yeah, whatever. It's a, it's a range that happens just like every trait in a species happens at different levels within each different individuals. But you can also tell that, that there are biological things that are part of us that lend themselves to empathy as well. I mean, take a look at mirror yeah. neurons, right? You can, you can put somebody in a, um, a CAT scan and um, if you show them someone suffering, you know, maybe they get a hand injury or maybe it's a foot or something like that. The part of the person watching's brain that relates to that, that, that hand or foot, exp you, you, you experience that. Your mirror neurons go off and you can actually feel for somebody their pain. Yeah. And, and those things are built into us. And brain damage you know, your capacity to judge things. And, mm -hmm. you know, so for example, you can have people who have damage to emotional centers of their brain have difficulty making value judgments. And, and on top of yeah, that... Yeah, that's like... The, on top of that, that's those... Like the thing with Phineas Gage and the frontal lobe. He had no, he had no empathy after the metal spike drilled through his head. Yeah, so it can, I, it I can mess with you. <laughs> Messing with your brain can really mess with you. Just, just to... Just to... Yeah. Yeah. Just to complete the loop on that, though, um, there are different strengths of responses when it comes to um, mirror neurons. And so you can have people uh, empathetically react much stronger than others. And in that way, you can, you can put a number on it. You're not, you're not measuring a, f a ruler versus you know, a, a, a meter. It's very much this is the strength of the response in the brain. Okay. All right. That's fair enough. I really enjoyed this call. We do have other callers. Did we hit most yeah, of Yeah, sorry. We realized we took up a lot of time. You know what, though? I think it was a really good call. It's really great to have an honest conversation with some folks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I learned a lot, so thank you for taking our call. Today. Thank you for your questions, and thank you for actually calling and asking questions that you were genuinely interested in answers to because we often get questions right. that people just want to manipulate a conversation. So it's great to have somebody say, I'm really asking because I'm curious. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Well, um, you guys have a good day then. Yeah, you, you too. Bye-bye. Can we clone them? Oh, gosh, I wish there <laughs> were every caller. Oh, my goodness. And that's the thing. I hope people understand that at the end of the day, I don't, it doesn't bother me that they hung up and they're still theists, right? It's like, that's okay. They called and they had questions and we had a conversation. We exchanged information. We mm -hmm. found things that we agree on, even though there's a big thing we don't agree on. It's, it was a cordial and informative conversation. I really, really liked it. So Definitely. Same okay. here. You don't have to call the show to try to trap us. It's not the... It's not where you learn. No. It's not where we learn. So it doesn't help anybody if you just call to, to ask a question that you already want to, you know, you already have an answer in your head. Don't waste everybody's time with that. Okay, so let's try here. We'll go with... That was good. Yeah, it was so good. This is oh. Aaron in Hyannis. Uh, yes, yes, and this is Tracy and Eric. Hey, yeah, thanks for I hanging on. Kind of my, bro my brother's name is Eric, so that's kind of a small world, you know. It is. Just Good name. Two people Strong name. Yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, uh, for, first off, <laughs> it's like a little quickie thing from uh, last week, the gentleman that was hearing voices. Mm. Which, whatever. which one? Wasn't there like uh, the, the guy, the, the second caller, the guy who okay. like, like didn't, basically didn't want to go to the... That was Teddy. The, yeah, te yeah, Teddy, thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah yeah, I actually knew someone, like a friend of a friend or whatever, who, who basically was hearing voices in his head, and then ended up he ended up going, going uh, getting some help, mm -hmm. and ended up being like a tumor, so or, or like either a tumor or it's like a stroke or something. Yeah. or something. And I think that that uh, John, was, I think it was John that was on with me, and he even said like, "Hey, this could be a physical issue that you need to get checked out," you know. 
So uh, yes, I, I mean we had some real concern yeah, hopefully, there. Hopefully Teddy's listening in today. And yeah, he, can, he went. He did show up at the blog, and some people gave him a lot of feedback, a lot of empathetic feedback. So hopefully, you know, he can figure his situation out and do what's best. Yeah, that's pretty cool, you know. I think so. But yeah, but but anyway, the, the main reason why I'm calling is. Now, let me preface this kind of a little bit. Uh, it's probably going to be a little confusing and, and probably a little simplistic in a way, but in a way it's not. But uh, like, like religious people, man, like Christians and others, I, I kind of like religious people that don't want that, that don't change their mind on their religions. I notice like basically fall into th three basic camps: the, pe the, the people that that are unable to, to change their minds about religion, i.e. like like head injured people or whatever. Mm -hmm. he, people that people that are just like total jerks about it. They just refuse to look at at the like the evidence or whatever. Like basically okay. saying why there that there is no God or whatever. Sure. And and the people that 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 don't look at the evidence but they they kind of stuck in their ways. They just kind of stay. St they're good natured. They're you know they're they're basically or basically good natured, but they and well me well meaning, but they still kind of get stuck in the religion. Sure. Religious bit. Well, that's I think what the other callers were saying. People are religious for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, and, and I like uh, yeah but, yeah pretty much you know the, for different reasons, but uh. And like the the people that are like, like like for whatever reason can't deal with it or can't change their minds and people that are just jerks about it, uh, like like I don't really deal with people like that too much and thankfully I don't have anyone that I know on a regular basis that are like that. But most of the people I know that are religious mm -hmm. are of the type that that are well-meaning. Oh, good. But you know they 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 but they play kind of play lip service to to. You know, like, oh yeah, I, I look in, look into all this stuff, but they actually don't. You know, they like look into history and look into like the scientific stuff and blah blah blah, but they act, they actually don't. If that, sorry if that doesn't make sense. I'm probably a little nervous, but, but how, basically, how do you guys deal with that type type of person? The the person that like they they're smart enough to well, look into more like the scientific stuff and all that, but they don't. I'm not sure that that's the person who's calling the show. I mean, do you yeah. see that person on the phone a lot with us? Because I, I think most people who are not inclined to, to care enough to look something up are probably not going to be inclined enough to pick up a phone and call the show to defend their beliefs. Well, I've heard a few, few uh, I've heard a few people calling up your your show, like like, like and basically like like generally speaking, like you can't think of any things in person, but but basically like like. A couple of times, not too often, calling up the show, like like like, who just refused to see that there might be good nature, like like, like the little old lady or whatever. Oh God bless you, just the same. Even though you know, I noticed that a little bit, but like I said, I run into people like that more. Like, like case in point, my my mother, 65 years old, she, she's religious, she's sm smarter than anything, but like all all the studying, but like, religious as anything is said. She studies up on on religion and all that, mm -hmm. but but for, like like actually uses religious material to basically confirm right. The, I the understand religious stuff. And like 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 every so often, like like or like actually send clips from you guys sometimes, or like 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 clips of, of videos from like other people, like, like common sense. Like I don't know if you, I'm I'm sure you guys know of Richard Shermer, like like this uh, skeptic guy. I know but Michael. A lot Sherman. of clips from him and all that. Yeah. But my mother like refuses to refuses to basically refuses to take that stuff seriously and just looks at like like the history through. Is she? I mean, has she expressed an interest in receiving these clips? Not really. She that just, may be the like, problem. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. just going to take a no, guess but, but that she's getting unsolicited like, material and saying, "Gee, thank you very much for." Your concern. Yeah. I mean, it may be that she's interpreting this as as what you might think of as "I'll pray for you." Right? She, yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much. You know, yeah, uh, and so the problem here is that she's not looking for a difference or a change. Yeah, it's kind of a shame, and like, like I don't know, like, like how you guys deal with that yourself. I just kind of like, like after a while, I just kind of like 
or not. We don't really get into arguments per se, but we get more like the discussions. And I cut back before things get into like arguments. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. But I guess I'm wondering. I mean, does she ever initiate these conversations? Sorry, I'm not supposed to snap my pen. And I uh, am. yeah, pretty fair, pretty fair amount. There's like a like a actually a period of time where she was trying to you know convert me and like because she was like worried ah, about my soul. Okay, blah, so blah, she blah. was she was pitching. She was in there yeah. pitching. Okay, and then she stopped. For, for a while, but before I told her, like, like hey, Ma, chill out. <laughs> okay, okay, so she, yeah, so now she's sort of getting payback, I guess. Yeah. Um, I it, mean, it sounds I like the, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I, she understands, it sounds like, that you don't believe what she believes. Uh, she yeah. made her pitch, and then it sounds like she backed off after a bit and kind of sank into her that she wasn't going to get anywhere. Um, yeah. You're pitching her some stuff. It's aggravating, though, because as I said, if, if like, the person is brain injured and can't think, like, like pass their thing, that that's one thing. Or if like, like, uh, or if they're like, like totally argumentative and they just like, like refuse to, like, like honest, they're honest about it. That's another thing. But people who think they're, like, my mother just thinks apathetic. she's, you know, like, she basically thinks she's, like, like, like. like Curious about like atheist stuff, but she's actually not. And that, How that's often me. does she bring it up anymore? Like any of this, is she still uh, bring it up? Barely. Once in a while, she'll like like come up with like a, oh you know, oh God's looking out for you, or, <laughs> or you know, like like she'll, she'll <laughs> mention like my, my name being like brother of Moses, like 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 oh your your name is like re- has religious meaning, so you know, so you're special. That means you're gonna be, be in a special spot or whatever, and blah blah blah. And, like little jabs like that more than actual. That's a little weird, up, yeah. Actual, what I mean, do you think about this or whatever, you know? I mean, maybe take those opportunities where she initiates something. Um, if nothing else, it'll it'll maybe squelch those few initiations that you still get. You know, I actually, yeah. I, my, my mom was actually like that. Go for it. Talk to this she, man. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, uh, my mom actually did that for a while. Um, and, you know, um, at first I thought, oh, the little jabs, I'll get right back, you know. Um, but uh, it, it took me living my best life. And I, I, if, if I'm going to give any advice, it's that. Live your best life because what you're doing is you are quietly and consistently showing that all of those preconceptions about atheists are wrong. And if you continue to behave in empathy and be kind and, you know, uh, just be happy, then she'll, you know, she'll notice. People do notice. And it took a very long... I, I did not expect my mother to approach me about atheism. Don't again. hide your light under a bushel. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I, well, and... and Sounds yeah, familiar. Yeah, I, I uh, was just completely blindsided when she was just like, so this atheism thing, tell me about it one day. I was like, what? I, you, we had a moratorium for years. Like, now we're doing this? Okay. But, um, yeah. you know, just, just do that, man. Um, because for somebody who doesn't want to talk about or argue about it, um, they, you, they can't deny when you are just the good person that you are. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, yeah, that, that, that's certainly how I try to live my life anyway, like actions, not words kind of thing, you know. But to, to, as you say, like in general anyway, but especially with my mother, the store, show people that atheists aren't like these evil little trolls or whatever that, you know, <laughs> hate really didn't or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you send her clips of Matt and Jeff D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> oh, maybe <laughs> not the best one. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that was actually really good advice. I can't top that. Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome advice, you know. Okay. Dear diary. Thank you very much. Another <laughs> random, big, qu- Tracy another said I had great advice. Quickie, random question. I'm sorry, and I'll let you guys go. <laughs> okay. Uh, it kind of has to do with, like, that, that whole, you know, like, 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 my mother did this a little bit, but more in a general sense, like, like uh, C.S. Lewis, who, who's uh-huh. famous for being an atheist, or was it? Is an atheist who ended up becoming religious? Oh, I don't know if he was an atheist. I, I, I just, I know his writing. Or, or like one way or another, he, like, like, he's known to be religious. Okay, yeah, know, yeah. Oh, about. yeah. Have you guys ever got this? And so what's up with this? Like, like my mother, and I've seen, like, heard a few other people doing this, but my mother gave me a few of his books, mainly, like, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe book. <gasps> okay. 
And I think, like, in a general sense, and they're not bad books, but in a general sense, hey, you read these, you might like these, but... Oh. It seems like 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 I've seen other people do doing that. And the, I and think that's an it. opportunity for a book exchange, <laughs> right? <laughs> I will read your books. I have a book you might like, Mom. Why don't we each read each other's books and then come together and talk about our books that we read? Yeah, but but oh yeah, I, I've 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 done that a few times with her. You know, I'm more like like general history stuff, but. Is that like like a common thing? Learning, with leaning toward people? hitch. Like I've noticed that a few things where like like here's a good book from a religious author that has nothing to do with religion, but oh. may turn you religious just the same. Or even Bart that Ehrman that would be a good yeah, well good primer. You know what's funny is um, I, I was a I was a kid in the church um, and. Uh, uh, the first uh, Harry Potter books were coming out, and the oh, yeah. California version of Hamish was the this this he's this um, he was this elder in my church, and he was complaining about Harry Potter, how it teaches witchcraft and wizardry, and and how you know you're going to be saying the magic words and inviting the devil into your soul. <laughs> and I I'm listening, and I was reading it, and I was like. It's just weird Latin. It, it's Latin-y sounding stuff, but and, and I, I said it. I spoke up. Don't. That was not good. Um, but, but 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 he said, "How dare you? You know, you're really you're you're crossing into the devil's territory." And I looked, and we were in the Christian bookstore, and C.S. Lewis, the 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 whole Chronicles of Narnia, was on the freaking shelf. And I looked, and I was like, "That has magic. Oh, that's just Witches. an allegory for Christ." <laughs> yeah. What? I haven't read the whole thing. I've read I think, like, like the first. One and a half, and I've yeah, I've noticed that that there might be some religious stuff, but that there's just as much magic in there, you know. Yeah, but I yeah. think it's that's okay since it does have you know religious, religious allegories or whatever, you know. And Harry Potter is a bunch of. You know, <laughs> but those are good wishes, whatever, and that's a dangerous message. Mm. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, we're gonna let you go, Aaron. Hey, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I like I'm rambling a little bit. That's all right. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get your thoughts together, so. It was a good call. Yeah. Have a good evening and good luck with your mom. Have a good. Okay, bye. I enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Let's see. We're going to go. It was fun. We're going to go to Josh in San Antonio. Oh, he's close. And this is Tracy and Eric. Hey. Hey, guys. How are you doing? First and foremost, I want to say thank you guys for all this aid. VA stuff. Uh, I became an uh, atheist when I was around 12, 13. I'm 32 now, but it was scary for me to come out friends or family or anything growing up and dealing with people in school, but had I had an outreach like this, I think that might have helped. So uh-huh. with that 200,000 that you guys just hit, then I, I hope okay. one of those is maybe a kid you guys are helping a teenager so grow too. To deal with all this better. Thank you. Yeah, it was now, on to this, I, I, for, first and foremost, I'm an atheist. I don't believe any of that paranormal stuff, but yeah. I have just a pondering. If I'm wrong in any way, please correct me. Um, now, we are just, you know, two, we are two dimensional beings. We only see 3D because we have depth perception. So, but we're in a 4D universe with space and time. So that's kind of cool, I think. But people are always about, oh, we see ghosts or this or that, or I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Our eyes can only pick up, I think, what, 30% of actual light. So oh, there's different light spectrums that we're not catching. So is it possible that our eyes are catching a glimpse of another light spectrum and we're just not aware Not if it's one we or... can't see. Well, that's what I'm curious about because I know our <laughs> eyeballs can't even see into it. I mean, we can only, you can only see there's what you can see, it. right? I mean, if I mean, you have to be able to Well, there's register. prisms and reflections and this and that. And I, it's just a lot. It's just what if. I mean, I, I don't contributed to it, but... I, I am at... Okay, you have, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that, that I would put too much stock in, in yeah, making I mean, too much of teenager, something like that. Stuff and, you know, I, I imagine that vision way, as a trait is, you know, goes on a spectrum. Some people can't see anything, can see no light, and there's probably like, people that are colorblind that see light in different ways. So, I mean, definitely within, within individuals in the species, we have that trait at, a, at different you know, capacities in yeah, each individual. I'm not quite sure where in Middle Eastern. 
But I'm not sure even at the best (laughs) that you're going to start seeing too much that's, you know, bizarre. Do you mean like ghosts? Yeah, because, I mean, if your eyes can't pick it up, how are you going to see? I I totally understand that and get that. It was just a pondering, like, well, maybe. I would tend to wonder if it wasn't something going on with my brain as opposed to my eyes. You know, like, is, yeah, well, did my I mean, brain just yeah, do a hiccup? You can rationalize it. Yeah, if you can see, I mean, you just can't. It's just one of those things, like, oh, you caught the horn, you're right, okay, cool, but how are you going to even examine that to know what that even is? Yeah, so, I mean, I've heard things knows? before that I know that I couldn't have heard, right? And, yeah, like, people right. talking to me that weren't I mean, there, like, understand. you know, it's so, yeah. I understand that that's just me falling asleep. and <laughs> that I. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, or uh, doing drugs. Like speak a name or something. Right. So, you, I mean, your brain actually yeah, is yeah. what's processing this stuff, right? So you have these yeah. input, the Brains sensory input brain. comes in, and then your brain yeah. sort of says, this is what you see, this is what you hear, this is what... And so that's why when your brain gets a little, you know, off kilter, uh, your senses become off kilter as well, right? You don't yeah. feel things because your yeah, nerves they're, aren't they're working they're like they should. And, uh, you know, you don't you don't see things or you do see things <laughs> because your brain is a little, you know, not doing what it, what it normally would do. And um, so, yeah, you, I mean, and that's another, I guess that's another thing. You can take drugs that would make you see things that aren't mm-hmm. there. There are prescription drugs that can cause hallucinations oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. there are medical oh, yeah, conditions definitely. that can cause that. So um, it's sometimes when you're seeing things, it's not because there's actually light doing something well, it's because your brain is you know, doing something that. well what i'm curious about with you bringing up the drugs there are studies that show with lsd and you know acid and mushrooms that's a higher elevation in your brain where instead of this little corner of your brain being active your entire brain is active so is it possible in that your entire brain being active with the drugs okay that it opens up a different light spectrum to your eyeballs. So yeah. Even though your eyeballs can't, aren't, they can't physically interpret that. I want to make sure that you understand that, like your your whole brain does actually work, right? I mean, people's yeah, whole no, yeah, brains yeah, 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 totally, do work. Totally, it's totally, not yeah, like we just yeah, have this little yeah. piece of brain that works, and then you take drugs and no, your yeah, whole brain. yeah, yeah, no. But yeah. I mean, I think, I but certainly different eyes, different brain yeah, centers yeah. are going to light up with certain chemicals yeah, sorry, that. I didn't use the, the proper. That's okay. Yeah, there are right, yeah, exactly. there are some misconceptions with that. I just want to make sure this wasn't one of them, but the, the, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. The different receptors and everything. So yeah, yeah, there are illnesses, there are drugs, there are experiences that can cause all kinds of, Eric was just talking a little while ago about, you know, people scanning people's brains for empathy Mm -hmm. um, and how you can tell like more and more empathy based on higher level of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, I mean, if you're going to do a drug that you know, you're going to trip balls on, why are you going to be surprised (laughs) that your brain lights up like four? Of July. Stuff, exactly, I yeah. mean, yeah, that's that's kind of you know why you did it in the first place. As, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as your eyes are concerned, you only have so many rods and cones. So, are you going to grow more rods and cones in your eyes temporarily to be able to? get that okay, visual yeah, exactly. data in. Right. No. Yeah, it's probably more likely something from another yeah, dimension has found a way to break through, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't understand, man. The portal's there. I have to say Next the week on Atheist Experience. Game over, man. There's we dimensions. lose. Yeah. Game over, man. <laughs> no, there are. And it's science, right? <laughs> Yeah, oh. I'm pondering, but I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having all this. I, I hope you guys can see this. And okay. Definitely. All right, all right cool. thank you. And now we get to go to John, who gets like the most patient caller award. So, John, you are talking to Tracy and Eric. You have been on since the show has started. You were the last line we're getting to from the the original lineup. So, thanks for your patience. Hi, John. Uh, thank you. So, what's up? So, all right. So, uh, I'm a teenage atheist in a Christian household. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And I just recently started to doubt my beliefs when I realized there's no good evidence for a God that I could find. So, okay, so my question is kind of off that topic a little bit. So where would you start when pointing out flaws in Christianity specifically? Okay, so first of all, does your family know what's going on? No. Do you want your family to know what's going on? No. Okay, so can I ask, what is this question for? Um, just, you know, it's kind of for me, but it's also for people who might ask questions about my belief. Okay, so right now what you're basically saying is that you don't have a belief, right? 
Oh, I have. Oh, I have. I have beliefs. I'm, well, no, I but I mean, as far God. as Christianity, you don't have like a belief in in this religion as being true or correct and right. in, in what it's claiming. Correct. Okay, and so yeah. what you're kind of you're. I'm going to give you some advice that a an, a preacher gave me one time who right. I was going to go in and speak to another preacher and defend my beliefs or my lack of beliefs. And uh, one of the things I was told before I walked in by another, by a third party preacher was, just remember you don't have to defend anything because you're not the one making the claims. Right. And that mm -hmm. was very important to me because the other person is the one making claims and the other person is the one that's got something to defend, right? As long as you're just saying, I, because what you said at the beginning of the call is you looked and you couldn't find sufficient evidence to support what you could call Correct. belief. And so you're not right. making a claim. You're not saying there's no God. You're saying if there is a God, I just don't see the evidence that's convincing me right. of it. So when someone comes to you and starts to make these Christian claims, you're not in any position to have to defend, right? You're in a position where right. they're claiming things and all you have to do is say, well, based on what? Like, where are you getting this information? And, and you just, all you can do is look at what they claim, go look it up, go look up the, the, what they're claiming, look up the crit critiques of what they're claiming, and then see what makes most sense to you. Do you think the critiques are valid or do you think that they're unfair? Do you think that what they're claiming, and sometimes, sometimes they can make a claim that's correct, right? Like somebody called earlier to say that the Bible says that the, that a constellation is bound together, and he's like, and it is by gravity, oh, yeah. right? And it's like, well, sure, it's yeah. bound by gravity, but you know, you see the stars all clustered together, so <laughs> I mean, it's like saying I'm bound to the earth by you know something. Um, well, sure, I see that. So it's not that there's a lot of claims in the Bible that are not incorrect because they are actually things that people witnessed and, and observed, and they are correct. But I had somebody the other day post, for example, this this description of something that happened with Moses, like why he saw a burning bush, and they were jumping through hoops to explain like how a person could think they were talking to a burning bush, like from a really purely scientific you know, perspective. And I wrote back and I said, you know, Moses is a myth, right? <laughs> we don't really have to explain how he talked to a burning bush because right. there's no reason to believe Moses existed. And so when I you... I mean, like... Go ahead. Okay. No, please go ahead. Oh, so like Noah's Ark and stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. we were talking about that today in my church, Noah's okay. Ark. Mm -hmm. There's like, and I just realized that there's no, no scientists seem to realize that there was a global flood like 4,000 years ago. Right. You're it's right. It's not something that's commonly understood. Yeah. It's funny how all the geologists and all, you know, like everybody that has anything to do with this, it basically says we don't, they're not, they're not postulating a global flood. And it was funny. We had a caller the other day that I just said, okay, well, I'll just give it to you because so we can move on with the conversation. But he was saying that people were asking him, well, what happened to all the water? Like, where'd the water go? Right? And it's like, that's actually a very good question. Yeah. What happened to all the water? Where did it, wouldn't it just, if the planet was covered in water, where did it go? <laughs> so, I mean, there should be some sort of geological evidence if there was such a large scale yeah. flood and you'd mm -hmm. be able to see it in the rock layers. What you're going to find out yeah. is that they seem to have no beef with anything in science except those aspects of science that don't back up what they're claiming. And suddenly they have all kinds of problems with science and it becomes a giant God-hating conspiracy uh, of, of you know, atheist scientists who don't believe the Bible and they were not gonna accept God. And what's really interesting is that a lot of these scientists are believers, right? So a lot of the scientists yeah. involved in this, this atheist conspiracy to disprove God and the Bible um, believe in God. Right, Francis Collins was uh, works with genes. Right, he's a genetic genetic scientist, and he's actually made comments about how you basically just from genes alone you can see the evidence of evolution in a way that makes it impossible to to deny. And this is a man who believes like Trinity Christianity. Right, I mean, this is like a hardcore Christian Christian. This isn't just like a <laughs> deist. So. It's uh, it's kind of amazing how they only seem to have issues with the science that is not biblically supported. That's where they kind of go deep. Yeah. Okay, so you would say like the biggest flaw with religion in general is just the burden of proof, 
basically. You can't say that you can't say that basically someone's making the claim they have to back it up and if well, you sure. don't, they don't you know you don't have enough evidence then you don't have to Yeah, when you when you have to start saying that science is a conspiracy in order to support your position that and this is what happens a lot of times they'll say oh Jesus existed and there you know and I know that this is a controversial thing that there are some a lot of people that are like Jesus didn't exist there was no Jesus there was this you know there's there's a lot of different perspectives on it but let's just say for the sake of argument that there is this mythical guy at the core of of the religious leader myth right of of the the miraculous yeah. Jesus so if you have that what they'll do is they'll pull out every biblical scholar that says that has that has requisite credentials that says Jesus existed as you know what there is a historic Jesus the moment you point out that those same scholars assert that he was very different and not the son of God as the Bible Jesus mm -hmm. suddenly they start disputing okay yeah. so a minute ago it was you can't just throw away all the work of these scholars and just take your you know like the mythicists who are the minority and you know and go with that just because it doesn't fit your narrative but the moment the, the majority of scholarship doesn't fit their narrative they do exactly that mm -hmm. the same scholars they are accepting who are saying yeah there was a historic Jesus are the same scholars who say this this yeah and it wasn't a miraculous son of God and yet they reject them when, as soon as you hit that point. Okay, so how about this then? So are there any flaws in like Christian logic? So when someone's trying to prove <laughs> oh, you, how man. much time do you have? Yeah. So like, what are those main ones that you can point out? So that's really the question that I'm getting at. You might want to look up like, just some... fallacies in general, uh, right? I mean, how, right. recognizing, because there's all kinds of, you know, there's arguments from popularity. Well, lots of people, you know, and the arguments for popularity are especially weird because those are just claims, right? So you have a writer who wasn't even there who's claiming that there was like 500 people that witnessed this thing and they all went and said this thing. And there's really no, it's just a story of a story of a story that he's writing down. And yet it becomes, well, this guy is claiming that he heard that there were all these people that saw this thing and then went and told other people. And so all those people can be wrong and so it's like it's an argument from popularity where you don't even know that you had a popular population that even ever did this or said it or believed it and then another one is ad antiquatum it's because it's really really old it stood the test of time and it's and what's hilarious is that you'll have people that uh it, they'll turn their nose at the fact that there are older manuscripts than the bible that have fiction written on them and oh of course those are really old stories but the bible yeah. Stood the test of time. It's I would read some. There's Bart. Bart Ehrman has a book out called Misquoting Jesus, where he just goes through what he learned in, you know, basically, I don't know if it was seminary or Bible college, whatever you call it, where he was studying, you know, manuscripts uh, that the Bible is based on, like the, the Greek manuscripts. And he writes about his experience and how he came to change his perspective from a uh, very conservative, you know, young, I don't know if he's a young earth creationist, but very, very literalist uh, Bible student um, to actually become far more open-minded and realize that, hey, these books aren't what I was raised to believe they were. And he's a very readable author. If you just want to see, like, what's really going on with the Bible, that to me is very, very impactive. Also, if you want to focus just on Jesus, um, David Fitzgerald's written a couple of really good books. Um, if you want to start with uh, Nailed, 10 Christian myths that prove that Jesus never existed at all. That's a fun read. Um, hopefully it'll help. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Appreciate yeah, sure. it. No problem. All right, well, good luck with that. And, you know, <laughs> it can be tough in your situation, but the good news is you sound like you're like an older teen, so maybe you'll be out of the house soon. Uh, I'm actually 15 right now. All right, so you got a couple years. Oh, man, I was a believer. Yeah. It'll go quick. Man. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go quick. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Man, All my right. head was so far up my own keister when I was 15. All righty. So, anyway. Let's, what do you think? We got a minute left. Let's um, let's see what, how it goes if we can do this. Or I don't know if, uh, if we can hit these in a minute. They're, they both seem like long-term topics. What I'm up for running long if you're, up for, if you're up for it. All right, we'll give it a shot. We'll try. Okay. This is Matt in Moscow, Idaho. This is Tracy and Eric. 
Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, very cool. Well, uh, I'm glad to be on the show. It's a very cool show. I love listening to you guys talk. Thank you. Um, Eric, in particular, I watched a show recently. You were on there with an aerospace engineer that was debating <laughs> a flat earther, and that was hilarious. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, EJ was amazing. Um, yeah, that was very cool. Um, anyways, I'll just get into it. Um, I grew up a uh, independent fundamental Baptist, and I'm looking into my beliefs more, and I'm trying to find a term for what I believe in. And the closest thing I can find is an agnostic contemporary deist, because I believe in a God, but I know that you can't prove or disprove that a God exists, as far as I know. You know, there's no tests that can be actually demonstrated to prove or disprove that. So um, I guess it's based on faith for me at this point. Would you agree with that? It depends on your God. Uh, there are some very, very specific things that some people say about their deities, and you can test those. Um, there, are some, there are some people who really, truly believe in intercessory prayer, and that's been tested. There are people who believe in miracle healings, and you can test for that. But there is a specific claim here, right? Because, so I get, you know, belief is different than, than you know, knowledge. I get that, and, and I'm down with that. So you describe yourself as an agnostic deist. You started out by saying you feel like it can't be, the question can't be answered at this time. So why are, do you feel a need to subscribe a belief to it without, without just getting better information? I think that um, just judging the possibility of a God existing or not, at this point, I can't rule that out. But why so would you then believe it, right? I, if I can't rule out Bigfoot mm -hmm. existing, I don't say, okay, well, then I guess I should believe Bigfoot exists. The way I approach that problem is, is by asking myself, if a God did exist, what would the qualities of that God be? And I try to answer that question and see if there is a God out there that, you know, what, what would it be like? You and know? you're saying that you have identified such a God? I don't think I have. I have identified things that that God can't be. But you're so saying that you believe, I mean do I, they're describing you as, a, as an agnostic deist. And I'm interpreting yeah. that to mean that you accept it as true that a God exists. Am I misinterpreting you? Um, maybe, maybe not. I, I, don't know if, I don't know if I would say it's true. I just say that I would, I am, I believe in such a thing because I choose to, if, if that makes any sense at all. I don't understand. I'm trying to, I'm, to I'm trying believe. to prove, not prove it, but I'm, I'm trying to prove it for myself or um, I can understand that. Up my faith with logic. Yeah. I mean, I can understand wanting to demonstrate, like if somebody comes and claims something to me, if I'm interested in it, I can see me wanting to, you know, prove the claim, like saying, okay, well then what, what would prove this claim? Let's see. Let's test this thing. Mm -hmm. I can't see why I would mm -hmm. believe it before I run the, run the testing. That's the process that I'm in at this moment is I'm, I'm trying to determine what what that is and, and if I can believe it or not, you know? Okay, okay. I guess I'm, I'm starting from the other end because I, I, be, I began my beliefs as a Baptist and I'm gotcha. sort of going away from that. So I'm, gotcha, gotcha, I'm gotcha. starting from that point of view. Okay, I understand what you're talking about and I totally relate because I went through the same process. I thought I heard you talk about that in a previous yeah. show, and so it okay. worked out really well that you're yeah. here. Yeah, I, I understand the point you're at. <laughs> so what is it that you need? What are you looking for? Um, From us, I'm anyway. Hoping... <laughs> we're not going to help you prove a God yeah. exists, so what, what could you need? That would be a cool trick. Though. Right, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think I, I was trying to figure out, do you guys, this is directed to each of you, I suppose, do you take the position that God does not exist, or do you simply refute the claim that a God does exist? I refute the claim that a God exists. And you, Tracy? I take the position that I can say a God does not exist to the same level of certitude that I could say that a fairy does not exist. So while I cannot prove or disprove the existence of fairies, I accept they do not exist for the same reasons that I would apply to a claim of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. Um, I think I was trying to figure out, you know, you were asking a question earlier as to why I believe in such a thing if I can't prove it, right? 
But I think I, I understand now why, because <laughs> you did describe yeah, the situation. I think it's a, I think it's kind of like a placebo, if that makes sense. I think a lot of people believe it because it makes them feel good about themselves or feel good about the possibility of something, you know. And I don't know if it actually has any positive effect, but I think it makes people feel better about what they believe. Well, I suppose. So I guess that's. I had really strong feelings. Like I had super strong feelings that I had a soul and that a God existed. And when the, when I left the church, that didn't go away, right? So I just kept, I just mm -hmm. felt like there was a God and I felt like I had a soul. And there wasn't, you, there was no arguing me out of my feelings, right? That was the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I went on the journey trying to define what is God? You know, what am I calling God since I know it's not the Christian God anymore. So what am I calling God? Right. What am I calling my soul? And it was that deep dive into years of trying to figure out what I was talking about, looking at all kinds of pseudoscience, looking at science, talking to people, arguing with people that believed other things, arguing with people that didn't believe anything about God, you know, just kind of running all this stuff, you know, narrowing it down, changing it, redefining it until there was nothing left. And that's what happened mm -hmm. to me. Now, I can't say that's what's going to happen to everybody but you sound like you're in the middle of a similar process. Now, where you're going to end up, I don't know. But right. my, my stuff was tied to feelings. Like, I felt like God was, you know, in my life. I don't know if you have that same experience. I feel like um, God is kind of a hands-off God. Okay. Because I think that if he was um, omnipotent or omnibenevolent, there would be a different world that we live in today. I would agree. Yeah. So then so if the God is that way. distant, right? And and uh, so then, mm -hmm. and you're saying that you're hanging on to it and you think it has to do with the way you feel about things in your life. But what, what kind of comfort does that give you? That he doesn't do anything? Um, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a comfort um, as far as, I'm not sure if it's a comfort. I don't know if that's the right word. I don't really know how to explain that feeling. Um, I think it's more of the way I see it is if a God did exist, I feel like that he would or it or she or whatever. Sure, sure. Say. I feel like the God, I feel like God would want um, us, some lesser being to understand him and the place that may have been created you know, that we live in. But I if, think that a search for knowledge in that scenario is something that he would... Um, but wouldn't deem. that entail leaving evidence? I mean, how else would we know I'm the not, God? Um, I think that... That's a good question. I don't. I don't know how we could. Like, if I'm a, if I create everything and then I like totally block myself off from it and I don't intervene and I don't look at what's going on and I don't mm -hmm. care about it at all, how mm -hmm. would that translate to me also wanting these beings to acknowledge my hand in this when I'm giving them nothing to go on, literally? That's a good point. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know either. I'm not yeah. trying to like, you know, oh, there's the trap. It's like, no, I'm just, that's, that's the first thing that pops into my head when you're describing your position. Matt, that's the well, best. that's why I'm calling, you know. I, I want you <laughs> okay. guys to point out these yeah. types of questions and ideas. I want to, you know, I want, I want my beliefs to be tested because if there's something that I believe that's false and can be proven to be false, then there's no point in me believing in that. I would invite Cheers. you, I would invite you to uh, post to the blog, right? This is Matt. Um, caller Matt, yeah. I would say post some of this stuff to the blog because usually I'm gonna nine times out of ten, you know, you, you, I'm not gonna say that there's there's nobody on there that can be brutal, but nine times out of ten, the the people are super cool with callers who are super cool. So if you say, hey, I'm searching, I'm I'm the caller, I was Matt, I'm the one who's trying to work out my beliefs, and here's kind of where I'm at with this, I'm pretty sure that they're gonna throw down some challenges, right? Most of them will be respectful challenges. So I'm telling the blog posters right now, be respectful. Matt is being respectful on the call, and I'm sure he'll be respectful on the blog and you should give him you know the benefit of the doubt give him some generous interpretations and give him some honest responses and be kind 
And at the same time, Matt, I'm going to warn you that when you post to the blog, it doesn't automatically post your post if you've never posted on our blog before. So mm. you'll have to get that post moderated. So the first time you try to post, nothing's going to happen, but it's only because your post is being held for moderation. The moment it gets moderated, you can post freely after that. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. It makes okay. Sense. So I would say go to the blog, kind of think about how you want to define your beliefs, put down sort of here are the high points of what I believe and I need some help to sort this out. Like, please tell me, you know, what, what do you see as like the questions that come up from somebody making the claims that I'm making here and see what they say. All right, I'll check it out. I'll yeah, do. I, th I think it'll be a fun experience. I spent a lot of time in forums and, you know, sometimes I felt <laughs> really beat up <laughs> after, you know, after a harsh week or something. But, you know, it's, it's like you say, it's the only way to learn sometimes. And, um, and I'm doing my best to make sure that they, they handle you politely and civilly because, you know, we, we, want, we always want everybody to be civil at the blog, but especially when someone is searching and, and giving an honest set of questions. For those who don't know, the, yeah, the name of the blog is... Well, it's, it's the Atheist Experience blog at, at uh, Free Thought Blog. So it's Free Thought, right, blogs forward slash AXP, I think is the address for it. They'll probably put it up. And in the meantime, we're not going to Star of India. <laughs> we're no. partying at the Free Thought Library oh. tonight. And um, Matt, does that help you? Yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate you talking to me. It's, it's difficult to find someone who... Uh doesn't get defensive about their belief. <laughs> yeah. I'm like talking to you guys about that. Hey, I, I am always open to an honest caller. You know, if you've got nothing to prove and you're just calling and you're like, hey, let's have a conversation. Here's what I think. Here's why I think it. Yeah, I don't know why I think that, but, you know, thanks for bringing it up. I mean, that, that to me is the best conversations. Just people that want to have a chat. Well, that's what I was here for. Thanks for, thanks for talking to me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, brother. Okay, bye bye. All right, have a good one, guys. Yeah, you too. You, too. you know, it, the, the most intellectually honest thing to me is to be able to say, I don't know. And yeah. when you asked him, and it, and, it, and it, he just, you know what, I don't know. That's a good yeah. question. Holy moly, stop yeah. the presses. That is fantastic. And did you notice I didn't smack him around? I didn't say, like, aha, you know? It's like, no. it was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not here to trap people. I'm not here. I'm here just, th you said this thing. It made me wonder about how that works in this regard, and I asked the question. And if you don't know the answer, you're right. You say, I don't know, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. And now, you know what? He can go home and he can think about it. And maybe he'll come up with a reconciliation and say, okay, this is how I'm doing this. Maybe I should have worded it differently, or maybe, you know, but whatever. It'll help him to define and redefine his thoughts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not about you know, proving him wrong or changing his mind or it's just about he's thinking. He's thinking about his beliefs and he's thinking about how he wants to define these things and that's only good, only good. Agreed, agreed. Uh, do we have time or do you think we're gonna... This is your call. Um, well... Uh, I'm gonna say, I mean, I'm the host technically, but... Well, the, the only things that I wanna say and make sure that I get out is Hey, everybody, we hit 200,000 subscribers. Let's get to 300,000 faster. If you haven't uh, liked and subscribed to The Atheist Experience, you're watching it on YouTube, do that now. And if you know somebody who wants to see it, pass it along. Let's do that. Give Talk Heathen some... Uh, we, we, we want to catch up. This is our big sister show, and uh, we're just so proud to be on here. Okay, we're 13 minutes past. Let's do it. All right, we're going to try. So this is going to be Justin in Colorado Springs. You're on with Tracy and Eric. Hi. Hey. Hello. So, I just, I know, like, atheists don't believe in anything. They believe in nothing. I'm assuming that you don't believe in the Bible. Well, right? I mean, I don't believe that everything in it is literally true, if that's what you're asking. Yes, that, that would be correct. Okay. But... Since science does back up the Bible, then why do you think the other things are not true? Okay, we talked to a guy earlier who believes that a man was swallowed by a fish and survived three days in the belly of that fish and then got spat up on a shore and survived. And this is a guy that was trying to tell us about the scientific proofs of the Bible who referenced something in Jonah. And when I pointed out that Jonah survived three days in the belly of a fish only to be vomited on a shore somewhere, he basically said, that's a miracle. And I said, okay, so your Bible is scientifically accurate except for when it's not. 
Is that the point? Do you have anything better than what he offered? Um, in Do you idea, believe in miracles? Yeah. Do you believe in miracles? In the miracles in the yeah. Bible? Okay, so you believe that it's yeah. scientifically accurate except for when it's not. It's not scientifically accurate in that part. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I can, anybody can write a book that's scientifically accurate except for when it's not. That's pretty much all books. Yeah. But that, that's the power of God, though. He can do yeah. things that but that's, we can't explain. But that's when it's not scientifically accurate. So me and you agree that the Bible is not always scientifically accurate. You just simply call it a miracle and say there's no problem there, and I say that's a big problem. Your Bible is not scientifically accurate. You simply excuse it as magic. Well, you don't... <laughs> I think you need to think some more about this. Maybe post to the blog or call back another time. Give that some thought, and we will talk to you uh, next week or whenever you call back. Again, you're free to post at the blog. I will give you the same advice I gave Matt, which is that your first post will need to be moderated, so please don't panic if you go to post and nothing shows up. Once you get moderated, once your comment goes through, you will be able to post at will, and you will not need moderation after the first comment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So go for it. And that was Justin. That was good. That was good. And I think that's, yeah. that's yeah, you know what, we were, we were going to take audience questions, but I don't know, these people probably want pizza. I, I want pizza. <laughs> I, you know, I, I apologize to, uh, to our producer, to whom I had said, yes, let's do audience questions, because, okay, <laughs> they're like, no, no, pizza, pizza. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. Um, I think I think we're good to go. So how do we how do we sign this off? How do we finish this? Um, I, they're supposed to tell us. I have I usually have like a like a goodbye. We don't have a goodbye. We need a there goodbye. There is. It's a, we sign are off. done and done. That's my goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>